condition our minds to think this way, we will see that the world is every bit as magical as anything Lewis invented. But we have to condition our minds to think this way. How is it that matter can become conscious? How is it that you can take, again, these protons, neutrons, and electrons, arrange them in a brainish way, and get something conscious and self-reflective? Something that I can think and feel. Can you do that with billiard balls? If you arrange them in the right way? Why not? It's just, it would be just as phenomenal, wouldn't it? So these are the kinds of things that, that uh, Lewis wants us to understand. So he says at one point, it is a profound mistake, this is from the book Miracles that he wrote, it is a profound mistake to imagine that Christianity ever intended to dissipate the bewilderment and even the terror, the sense of our own nothingness, which come upon us when we think about the nature of things. It comes to intensify them. Without such sensations, there is no religion. Many a man brought up in the glib profession of some shallow form of Christianity who comes through reading astronomy to realize for the first time how majestically indifferent most reality is to man, and who perhaps abandons his religion on that account, may at that moment be having his first genuinely religious experience. Christianity does not involve the belief that all things were made for man. So I think here of Neil deGrasse Tyson, a famous astronomer, who's always arguing how now we understand that we don't matter one little bit. And why does he think this? Well, because the universe is a big place. But first of all, people have always understood that it was a big place. Ptolemy thought that the distance between the Earth and the closest star was so great that the whole Earth could be considered a mathematical point with no size whatsoever, just completely negligible. So people have always known that. But he's just not seeing it right. The vastness of the cosmos, to the mind that's rightly disposed, as Joe was saying, right, it depends on which direction you're pointing when you start these things. The mind that's rightly disposed sees the vastness of that cosmos as magnifying God, not as marginalizing Him. The things that we get so used to, that we get jaded about, these are wondrous. There shouldn't be any listlessness among Christians. There shouldn't be any ennui, any boredom with the world among Christians. Why does salt dissolve in water and not sand? Well, I mean, we could talk about ionic bonds and covalent bonds and things that happen tear apart and dissociate water or uh, salt in water, but why should anything conduct electricity? It's, it's magic. Why should we be able to breathe air but not water? And fish can breathe water but not air, except the bishop fish, I guess. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton was one of the biggest influences on Lewis, and he, he puts it this way. If the apple hit Newton's nose, Newton's nose hit the apple. That's a true necessity because we can't conceive the one occurring without the other. That's a matter for logic. But we can quite well conceive the apple not falling on his nose. We can fancy it flying ardently through the, hair, through the air to hit some other nose of which it had a more definite dislike. <laughs> we have always, in our fairy tales, kept this sharp distinction between the science of mental relations in which there really are laws of logic, and the science of physical facts, in which there are no laws really, but only weird repetitions. Why does the ball fall? Just a weird repetition that we've all come to expect. Nothing grabs it. Why shouldn't it just float right there, or drift off into the, into the air, or explode, or who knows what? Just go zipping around. Weird repetitions. So when did we get so bored with the miraculous and the wondrous? That's what Lewis calls us back to reflect on. It seems to me that really there are sort of three stages of development. We think of youth, right? The, what I was talking about before, when the world is it's this magical place, and for all we know there really is a monster under our bed. And then we kind of lose that. We become jaded and cynical. But then there's this third stage of development that we really need to go into if we're going to truly mature. A kind of second youth that recaptures this sense of wonder with the world that the secularism wants to denude it of. This is, uh, Lewis loves Lucy and dedicated the Narnia, the first of the Narnia books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, to 
a real Lucy uh, that he knew. And he says this to her, and I think this is very telling. My dear Lucy, I write this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realized that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you're already too old for fairy tales. And by the time it's printed and bound, you will be older still. But someday, you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. You can then take it down from some upper shelf, dust it, and tell me what you think of it. You see, that's what he is saying. If you really want to grow up, you've got to get to that next stage, where you again see the magic and the wonder of the world. How do we lose it? We lose it from suffering. We've all suffered. And if we haven't suffered much, we will. We can lose it through cynicism. We can lose it, lose it through habit. We can lose it, lose it by uncritically adopting the world's mindset of reducing things to clinical explanation and trying to say, therefore, the mystery is gone. But, you know, humans are called anthropos in Greek, which it comes from the word meaning to look up, or I look up. That's what it is to be a human. To be one who looks up. This is what Socrates says in Cratylus, Plato's dialogue. I mean to say that the word man implies that other animals never examine or consider or look up at what they see. But that man not only sees, but considers and looks up at that which he sees. And hence alone, he, of all animals, is rightly called Anthropos. We were made by God to be curious and to marvel at his works and to see, as the psalmist puts it, that the heavens declare his glory. And so we need to be on our guard against demythologizers. Again, as Chesterton put it, the function of the imagination is not to make strange things settled, so much as to make settled things strange. That's what the imagination is for. God wants us to be like little children and to think of, you know, this is what Jesus said. I want you to come to the kingdom as a little child. Again, let me quote from Chesterton here. Because children have bound, un, uh, abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again! And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people, grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. This is what Lewis is conveying in all that he writes, too. And what Job says, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. So Lewis uh, would agree with what Job says. Job says in chapter 37, At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does, not, he does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour, so that everyone he has made may know his work. He stops all people from their labor. The animals take cover. They remain in their dens. The tempest comes out from its chamber, the cold from the driving winds. The breath of God produces ice and the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. At his direction they swirl around over the face of the whole earth to do whatever he commands them. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. 
Stop and consider. That's what Lewis wants us to do. My professor, my psychology professor, had it wrong. It is God doing all those things. And the mere fact that he follows and doesn't get bored with doing them again and again, and that we can note his weird repetitions, as Chesterton put it, that doesn't remove God's hand from it. So choosing this attitude of stopping and considering, we don't actually need to invent magical creatures to fill the world with wonder. As Lewis says in The Weight of Glory, one of what he said was the favorite thing that he his favorite thing that he had written, The Weight of Glory, which is just a, a, a short piece, short address, take you 10 to 15 minutes to read it. He says, the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would strongly be tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. This is not an ordinary world. There are no ordinary events. He uses this in the Space Trilogy to get us out of our own element. This is one of, uh, another reason to read the Space Trilogy that I mentioned earlier. Because in this, Lewis can again invent another world, or several other worlds actually. And by doing that, he gets us to look back with this new kind of sharpened vision at our own world to understand it. And in particular, one thing I think that always uh, touches me when I read Lewis's stuff, and I've never read any of his books without crying, usually multiple times, about something, because he's so touching. But one of the, the central themes is that God would love us. That God would love us. And if we think about this, if we think about the creator of all these wondrous things, caring about us, this great majestic Aslan, you know, shedding a tear for this insignificant little boy. When we think about the fact that the creator of the universe, the all-knowing, all-powerful, everlasting, eternal king, cares about us, and as Jesus says, go in your closet and pray in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, that God is attentive to us to the point of knowing the hairs that we have on our head, and he's got them all numbered. Even though he's also the God who sends the rain and the lightning and calls out the Pleiades and Orion. That is a source of everlasting wonder. And I think that's why Paul says, this is a divinely revealed thing that we need divine power to understand. In Ephesians 3, he's praying for the Ephesians and he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches... He may strengthen you with his power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ. This is something that takes great power. This is, we need magic here. This is a spell that only God can bring to bear. If we're going to understand his love, we're going to need his help. This is the greatest wonder, that God would love us. So as we see this world so infused with God's activity, so filled and rich with magic and wondrous things, we can say with Job this same thing, that he performs miracles without, without number. He does things that the mind cannot fathom. In one encounter, when Lucy comes back to Narnia after her, after the first book is over, she comes back in Prince Caspian. And what, what Lewis wants us to see is that there ought to never be an end to our thirst for more of this wonder, this sense of awe before God. God is greater than we could ever imagine. There's endless wonder and delight in even his ordinary works. And so he meets up with Lucy, who's gotten older and grown bigger, and Lucy says to Aslan, Aslan, you're bigger. Bigger than the last time she had seen him when she was in Narnia before. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are, she said. I am not. But every year you grow 
you will find me bigger. This is what God calls us to. And this is what he has for those who will seek him. So I would ask you to pray with me too. God of wonders, we lift you up. I uh, pray for our hearts and our minds and our souls to have the strength to see you and to praise you and to give you the glory that you deserve for the wonders that you perform around us every day, God. Open our eyes. Open our eyes so that we can see the truth of who you are and give you the glory that you're due and increase our capacity to understand and worship and appreciate and love you. For you are boundlessly worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So thank you, Joe, Brad. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Thank you all for coming to St. Dunstan's today. I'd like to thank Jenny Wood for the music, Donna Lennon and Jean for the hospitality, Lucille for advertising, Beth for the crafts and kit wrangling, Kathy for the lamppost and the men's group for the kites, the ushers, and everyone else who helped with this event. If you've not found them uh, already until 3, they're still dog sledding down in the park, um, and they do take adults. Uh, they take a couple of adults. Uh, there are crafts for children and a lamppost downstairs suitable for pictures. And uh, I believe there's still refreshments. Uh, if you enjoyed uh, today, we uh, welcome you to come back. Uh, we have services on Sunday at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. And we're starting a C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity book study during the Lenten period at 9 a.m. Uh, thank you again for coming and God bless. Thank you. First, a quick, super quick announcement. <laughs> um, if you are going to come to the, to the book study, and have it sign up on the, uh, the sign-up sheet, please do that, but make sure your email address is there, and later on this evening, I'm going to send out the, the reading schedule uh, for the next